Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? Tonight's second half is a group of interviews I had done with a retired sheriff out of North Carolina. And each interview was about 45 minutes long, sharing right up from his first experience, actually his his father's experience, all the way through. And uh, a very tragic experience that haunts him still to this day. Let's get into it. Before we go any further into the interviews, the photo that you're seeing right now are is a photo that he sent along with the interviews um, or to go with the interview. And the furthest circle from where his vantage point would be, you can see something bipedal right there. Uh, I've known Lewis now for four years and he is the furthest thing from a liar or a hoaxer. And I really do, uh, believe this, this photo to be authentic. All right, everybody. Uh, tonight I've got a really great guy. Uh, I've chatted with him a couple of times and he's had Quite a few dogman encounters. He is a retired sheriff's officer from uh, North Carolina. His name is Lewis. Lewis, say hi to everybody. Hey, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. All right. And um, you were talking earlier that you had roughly five encounters. Um, yes. You want to start from the beginning and share with everybody what what has been going on with these because you said you think you're cursed with these guys um i think it's where you live you know where i mean because you're out in the woods and so the floor is yours brother all right well my first encounter uh was back in 1970 i was uh, five years old i had just started school um we had lived in Charlotte, and uh, we had moved up to Gaston County, close to uh, Spencer Mountain um, and McCaddenville. Uh, my father had lung cancer, and, and the doctor wanted to get out of the city, so we did. Uh, I was four when we moved there, and I had started school, I guess I was, I was in school for about two, three weeks, um, and um, my my mother, she never liked it up there. She just always had a bad feeling about that place. And uh, I remember it was it was had rained the night before, and I wanted to go out and and play, uh, you know, with my toys. I had some Tonka trucks and stuff. And, uh, Mom said, okay, well, I'll, I'll let you go out, you know, and and uh, take a towel with you and 
you know, she knew I was going to be sitting in the dirt. Well, um, I have to explain how this house was. It was uh, actually a duplex, and when you walked out the back door of the kitchen, there was like a 10 by 10 deck, and it was like 20 feet off the ground because the house was built on a hill that sloped. And you walked out on that deck, and then you turned to the left and would go down a set of steps right up against the bricks. And then there was another, about 10 foot down, another area, about a four by four area, and then it turned to the right and you went down to the ground. Well, the the ground was mostly red mud and had quartz rocks. There was a little bit of grass. And I remember sitting there playing and the way it was, the the yard was in the back, it, it went down probably about 40 yards to the best of my recollection. And um, somebody had cleared out most of the trees that just had oak trees and they were in a line, different lines. And as you went down farther, there was a little creek and on the other side of that creek, it was just thick pines. Well, I was out there probably 15, 20 minutes and uh, I caught something in front of me and uh, it was white and grayish looking and it was huge. Now, I, I watched a lot of cartoons and to me, it looked like a polar bear and that's what I thought when I first saw it. I, you know, it's crazy as it sounds. But I, I seen it go and it kind of went out of sight and I continued playing with my dump truck and stuff. And then I happened to look up and it's closer and it's coming back to the left in the line of trees. And there's like four or five rows of trees that comes up from that little creek. And I watched it, and it went all the way to the right and vanished out of sight. I kept playing. And then I looked up again, and it was a row closer to me. And it only had one more row to come up to where I was at. I was about 10 foot from that first row of trees. And I started focusing on this thing. And I, and I wasn't scared. Uh, um, it it reminded me of a polar bear. It was almost cartoonish. Uh, and then when it, I just continued to watch it, and this thing was huge. Now, I guess I was probably three and a half, four foot tall, and this thing was on all fours, and it would have been at least two foot taller than me uh, uh, when it was coming by, and. When it got to the last row of trees, it stopped. And it was right dead in front of me. And I remember just looking at it, and it had its head down. It, 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 it didn't look at me. And all of a sudden, it turned its head and looked at me. And that's when I started getting scared. And something just didn't feel right. And I could see its teeth in its mouth. And its eyes was red. Just, uh, maybe it's just because I was so young, but they looked like, like coals. They were just so red. And this thing was white, and it had like gray patches on it. And absolutely huge. And so I started scooting back a little bit, and uh, it growled. And when it growled, uh, I stood up. And when I stood up, it stood up. And my dad was, you know, a pretty tall guy. He was like 6'4". And this thing would have towered over my father. And it just looked at me. And I remember just in such fear and... I couldn't move. Uh, I don't know why I 
didn't scream out then for my mother, uh, but that's coming. <laughs> this thing, uh, when it stood up, it was, I could see its chest and it was a pinkish color and it had orange mud on it. And I could see the muscles that this thing had. And it was just uh, the biggest thing I had ever seen. And I knew then that something wasn't right. And I started to take a step backwards. And when I did, I tripped over my Tonka truck. It was a little tanker truck. And I fell ass first in a mud puddle. And when I hit that, this thing let out a growl that I could feel all through me and it was like electricity. Then I started screaming. And I started going up the first flight of steps backwards, like a backwards crab crawl. And I remember trying to go up those steps and find it, find each step. And this thing started taking steps towards me. And I made it up to the first platform, and it went down on all fours uh, at that time. And I was screaming and crying, and I just remember the fear in me. And uh, the next thing I know, I had a big jolt from behind me. My mother had grabbed me by the back of my shirt and my ass was off the steps. The only thing that was on the steps was my feet, and they were clicking, coming up. She was dragging me up the steps, and my shoes came off. I remember that, and she was screaming, go back to hell, go back to hell, and um, I was screaming and crying, and, and when she got me up to the top, she opened up the door and just slid me in, and she went in and shut the door. Well, this thing started coming up the, the steps and it came all the way up to the, the very top and stood up. And me being young, I know this going to sound kind of crazy, kind of funny in a way, but me being young, you know, you, you think your parents are going to protect you. And I remember my mother shutting the blinds and looking up through the glass of the door because she had to look up to see the thing. And I remember her standing by the door with a broom. <laughs> she had a broom in her hand. <laughs> and I was like, you know, thinking then, you know, I think about it now, you know, what was mom going to do with that broom, you know? <laughs> but mom called my father and my father told her to maybe because mom was just going off and, and, and my dad could hear me screaming and crying in the background. And uh, my my father told my mother to, to call the law. And so she called and my father was on the way home. Uh, and he got there probably 10 minutes after and he, he drove all the way from Charlotte and it didn't take him long. He, he must have been flying, but when the time he got there, there was four or five sheriff deputies with shotguns, and they seen the prints that were on the, the back porch, you know, uh, and how big they were, and they were talking amongst each other, and my dad showed up and, of course, jumped out with and run in with his pistol, and, you know, they told him, you know, to put his pistol down and that they was going to handle it, and my dad was very upset and just wanted to make sure me and mom was, was okay. And, uh, it was just something weird about that place. Uh, I'll tell you something real quick. Uh, when I was four, when we first moved there, I guess it was, a uh, a few months, uh, after we had moved there and it was Christmas Eve. And me and my mother were sitting in the living room watching TV. And I was sitting right beside of her. And the Christmas tree was right beside the TV. And uh, we're, we're waiting on my father to get home from, from work. And all of a sudden, there was this loud growl that came 
came from inside the house. And the Christmas tree was like somebody grabbed it and shook it as hard as it could shake it. The balls were flying off the, the tree, lights, everything was flying off the tree. The tree was, was snapped, the top of it was snapped off. And there was busted glass everywhere. My mother had snatched me up and we were scared to death. And that kind of, my mother, like I said, she really didn't like that, that place. There was something just not right about it. It was haunted or something. And, uh, so after the uh, dog man, and I didn't know it was a, was a dog man, uh, uh, you know, being that young, uh, you know, I, I, I just knew something bad happened and I, I'd never seen anything like that and from the reaction of my mother and everything. But uh, after the law enforcement left, I remember my mom and dad having an argument and my mother telling my father, uh, I'm packing up now, and me and your son are leaving. If you want to stay here, be my guest. Well, the next day, we moved. Um, that was my my first encounter with with something like that, and uh, yeah, I was I was terrified. And um, after that, and I, I don't know why, but do you remember the uh, yeah, the yeah. Pillsbury Doughboy? You remember him? Yeah. Little Pillsbury. Every time it would come on TV, I would start crying and screaming and tell, tell my mother I hated that Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why I put those together. Uh, kids do the craziest it, you know, things, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really don't. No. So after uh, after that, you guys moved. How uh, how much time passed before you had your next encounter? Uh, well, what happened after that? Now, when when I was was sixteen, uh, there was my my father passed away when I was fifteen, and. Uh, when I was 16, me and my, my mother were talk, was talking and friends, um, and she had told me a story about my grandfather. And my grandfather lived in Bessemer City, uh, North Carolina, and he started the first taxi company back in 1929. And he had three taxis. Uh, he uh, had two drivers, and then he drove one. And uh, there was a this was a hush hush story that stayed that always that was in the family that nobody talked about. And my grandfather one night had. Uh, he wasn't living right. He was drinking and all kind of other stuff. And uh, but he he ran his business, you know. Uh, supposedly, you know, I, I never got to meet him. He passed before I was born. And um, he had picked some people up at a, a shack or. or uh, I'm trying to think what they called them back then, but uh, it was illegal to, to drink. Was it and like a speakeasy? They, a speakeasy? Yeah, a speakeasy, exactly. Uh, so uh, he picked up two couples, uh, two men and two women, and, uh, and they wanted them to drive them out to this shack. You know, it was all dirt roads back then, and, you know, it was like 10 miles out in the country. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you know what was going to go on in there. That, but anyway, he, they, they paid him $50, uh, to take them out there and sit in the car and wait on them until they were done, you know, and they, 
they, they paid him for like two hours to sit there. Fifty dollars was a lot of money back then, and so he was uh, sitting in the the car uh, asleep, trying to get some sleep, and the car rocked, and he thought it was maybe them ready to go, and he he yelled out and said, "Hey!" Because he didn't know how long he had been asleep for. He said, hey, y'all, y'all ready to go? And he got no answer. And uh, he just sat there for a minute, and the car rocked again. And he happened to look up, and there was this, how he described it was the devil. Um, he said it had red eyes. Um, and it was tall, hairy, it looked like a dog. Um, it had the pointy ears. Um, but he actually thought that, that it was the devil. Uh, and he cranked the car up and he started hauling butt. Well, this thing jumped up on the running board of the driver's side of the car and was staring in at the window and growling at him. And it it jumped off the running board two or three times and would jump right back on. He had the car floored, was trying to get away from it. And when he got back home, he was so scared when he got home because this thing jumped off uh, when he got out to the main road. And uh, but it was still a dirt road. And and when he got home, he was so scared that he drove, he didn't stop the car. He drove the car into the, up on the porch into the living room. And (laughs) the next day he sold his taxi service. And uh, that was on, I think a Friday night, what they said. And he was in church and got saved uh, that next Sunday morning. It changed his life forever. I remember uh, when you first told me that, that story. A couple, I, like yeah. you told me that about a year and a half ago, and it yeah. just it, that was one of the the stories that I've heard throughout you know the couple of years that I've had this channel that stuck with me because you know your granddad was terrified and just you know that shows the amount of fear that he's flying yeah. home and just you know he's like I'm just gonna park it inside the house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He made a drive through, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I mean, I, I can't even, uh, you know, mm. uh, imagine what he must have went through. And you know, uh, I don't know how, how how if people seen dog men back then uh, as much as they do now. Uh, I think they did. I think it was just harder for. I think the internet age is what brings so many encounters out. You know what I mean? Like the the stories can travel faster nowadays. You know, with with the internet. I think if they had the internet back then, there'd probably be about the same amount of encounters, maybe even more, because times were different. But you know, I think it's just I I don't really think there was a, a too big of a jump. You know what I mean? A lot of people, yeah. a lot of people are like, well, you know, how can there be so many encounters that, you know, you're, you're doing in one a day, you know? And I'm like, well, most of the encounters that I'm doing are from years past. And, you know, it's just because of the internet and Facebook and, you know, all the other social media platforms that put people into, you know, touch with each other, because, you know, you live in North Carolina, I live in upstate New York, I wouldn't be able to talk to you, you I wouldn't even know who you were if it wasn't for the computer, you know, so I think yeah. that was uh, the big thing that brought all of these encounters that we can kind of lump them all together, so all now right. your th- second encounter was what, when, what, how old were you when the second one that you had happened to you? Um, I was in... I was in my my thirties uh, when this my second encounter. Were you a police happened. officer uh, then? I'm sorry. Were you a police officer then, the sheriff? No, okay. no. Um, I had a, I had a pretty good life. I uh, I, I raced motorcycles for Honda professional, uh, and then I went to 
worked for Ford Motor Company. I was an engineer for Ford for 14 years. Uh, then I opened up my own business, and uh, that's where my second encounter happened in uh, Rowan County. And I lived off of Highway 3. And I was living in, in Rowan County when Dale Earnhardt was killed. And I, I used to do a lot of work for for his mother and family members uh, at my shop that, that I had there. And anyway, I had a towing service too. And, and uh, you know, uh, a couple of my drivers had, had told me of things that they had seen uh, at night, but they thought maybe it was a bear, but they, they didn't know if it was a bear or not. And uh, because it would get up on two legs and, you know, and and I really didn't put two and two together on it because the, the my second encounter with one of these things, um, me, uh, I was living at the end of a dead-end road and it was kind of out in the country off of Highway 3 and um, in Rowan County. And... There was a big cow pasture uh, field at the very uh, part of my backyard, and and the other part was woods. And then there was a big stream uh, on the other side of the pasture, and then there was another cow pasture that did have cows in it. Well, uh, I was married, and me and my my wife would go down to that creek and paying for gold you know and we'd find little gold nuggets and we'd just do that on the weekend and we were down there uh we had done it many a times and uh well I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself one of my my friends uh from new york had came down and uh, visiting and um uh i had just bought me a a new Harley Davidson, and they came over to have dinner, and 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 they were going to stay for a week, and he was going to hang out at the shop. Well, anyway, we have dinner, and I had a, a a dog named Chewy, and he was a chow, and I had him on a runner in the back, and it was a real long runner, and I mean he he just had it made, good dog, and I would you know let him off, he would he would you know, come in the house and, and go for rides with me and stuff. Well, um, they were there at the house and, uh, we had dinner and we had played some cards and Chewy was in the backyard just going crazy. And I looked out a few times and never seen anything, you know, out the window. And, um, so it was, I guess about 11 o'clock and they were getting ready to leave and we opened the door to walk outside and as soon as we opened as soon as I opened the door this smell hit us and the only way I can describe it is like uh, a skunk the worst skunk and death and like a a cow a wet cow or something that had that just that animal smell and I, I thought it was possibly a, a, a skunk because Chewy was uh, shining a flashlight back there and he was in his doghouse all the way up as far as he could get in the doghouse and I was like uh huh mess with a skunk he got you so didn't think too much more about it they left uh friends and uh and the next morning, me and the wife got up because uh, that was on that was on that would have been on a Friday night, and it was Saturday, and we went down to the creek to to do a little gold pan, you know, just goof off. And when we got to the edge of it, it was like a ten foot dip to go down in there, and it was sandbars. And uh, my wife said, "Why is that?" And we were standing up there at the top, and I looked down and I said, "Man, that's a footprint." And she said, 
what? Couldn't make that kind of footprint. That thing's huge. And I said, I don't know. So I started going down the, into the, the creek. And she's like, no, don't get down there. I said, no, I want to see what it is. So I went down and, and, and looked at the, the footprint. And it was probably 14 inches long and had claws on the front of it. And uh, it, it looked like a, like a dog print, but stretched out. It, it looked more kind of like a like a cat print, like a big cat, but it, no cat could could have a fourteen inch. You know, it was kind of skinny. You know, it just got skinnier as it went back. And whatever the thing was, uh, I started following it, and my and my wife wanted me to to come back. You know, she said, you know, don't don't follow that down the creek. You don't know what that thing is, and. So I lodged her, uh, and, and we went back home, and I had a fifty caliber Desert Eagle. I grabbed that thing, and she said, where are you doing? I said, I'm going to go see where that thing went and what it is. And she gave me down the road about it, but I went, I went on down there, and I went through the creek, and whatever this thing was, it had like four and a half foot strides. And... Uh, it was intelligent enough to walk around the water and onto the sandbars. It would skip the water. And I come to a point where on the other side of the creek where the cow pasture was and the cows were, where it had went up and there was cedar posts that had barbed wire on it and that one of those posts were snapped off at the ground. And I was like, well, whatever it was, was strong heavy at least and I followed the tracks back and they went through the field and this field was made of bull talon which is that's some, that's some you know what bull talon is it's a it's where a cow pasture used to be and and it's all hard real if anybody's ever tried to, to dig in bull talon it's just hard dirt and but there was prints and I followed those prints, and they came right up behind my house. And I showed my wife that, and, you know, that freaked her out a little bit. And it was about two weeks later. Um, I was out on the back deck, and the deck wrapped around. There was, there was a patch of woods there. And the, the, the deck come from the back door and come out and come around uh, almost to the front of the house. And it ended right there. And I had my grill and everything set up. And I had one of those yellow porch lights. That, and I had a couple of T-bone steaks on the grill. And I guess this was about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And uh, I was hearing something you know and you know it, it was it was dark you know and and I kept hearing something that sounded like something was breathing and but I couldn't I couldn't see you know because those yellow lights aren't that aren't that bright you know we, we had a floodlight on the house too but we never cut that floodlight on you know um and I had a grill light on the grill that just hung over the grill so that I could see the cooking. Well, there was a little window right there that me and the wife would pass food through. And, you know, she was making our salads and baked potatoes and I was doing the steaks and, and I knocked on the window and I told her, I said, go get my pistol and my flashlight. And... She said, why? I said, just please go get it for me. And so I've got the grill open. And I go to cut the flashlight on, and the flashlight batteries are dead. And I told her, I said, cut the floodlight on. As soon as she cut that floodlight on, what I saw in front of me, I will never forget it for the rest of my life. This thing was standing there and 10 
10 feet away from me and I couldn't see it. The, the fur on this thing, it had pointy ears and I was standing on a deck that was about three and a half foot off the ground and me and it were eye level and, and I'm six foot tall. So this thing had to be eight and a half, nine foot tall. Muscular shoulders were about four feet wide, um, ripped. Uh, would have put Arnold Schwarzenegger to shame. And it was the colors hard to describe. It was uh, like a you know what fiber optics look like. You know it has the the ends of fiber optics. Is like kind of a sheeny color. Yeah. Uh, and that's what it looked like. And this thing had uh, the face of a German Shepherd, but its head was the size of a 14 inch car tire. I mean, I, I was in shock. And everything happened so fast. It was just staring, just staring at me. Well, what ended up happening is. Now, this happened within like a second of what, I, what I, I just told you there. When she cut that light on, my wife automatically started screaming. The dog was in the house. The dog started going crazy. And when I seen this thing in front of me, I had a beer in, in uh, my left hand that I had set on the grill. And the grill was open. And when I seen this thing, I jumped backwards and my foot hit the, the bottom of the where the wheels were and the grill slammed shut. And when the grill slammed shut, this thing jumped. It was like it scared it. And its ears went backwards on, the, on its head. It leaned down a little and dug its foot in like a, a linebacker would do. And all I seen was teeth. And I, I started cussing. I, I just knew I was a dead man. And I, I pulled my pistol up and I just aimed it straight at its face. And I was cussing it and telling it, come on, come on, you SOB. You're going to get me, come on, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you too. And it just sit there and looked at me. And, but with his ears, pulled back on his head like that. Uh, and especially when it dug its foot in, it, 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 I could see it twist its foot in like it was getting ground, like it could leap. And and this thing put its head up in, in the air and its ears went back forward again. And it looked at me and went, <clears throat> as if to say, you're not worth it, or, and 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 turned around and just walked off. And two steps, he blended in, and I, I couldn't see him anymore. But I could hear him, you know, for a good ten seconds going through the woods. And uh, that was my my second encounter. Uh, now, I moved from there to where I'm at now, which is about 40 miles away. And when I first moved here, uh, I've got seven acres of land. When I first moved here, uh, I was a hunter for a long time when I was younger. And when I moved up here, I started hunting and I fished more than I hunted, but I'd, I'd still hunt, you know, because a lot of the people I met, my friends around here, they hunted too. And uh, a lot of land behind me, thousands of acres uh, at one time, they've started developing a lot of it now. But um, I went back in, in, in the woods and I, I uh, put deer stands up. I, I got a couple of nice 
nice deer because um, I thought I had got away from these these things. Um, but obviously they're everywhere. I mean, uh, or it's just my luck. I don't. I really don't know. But I lived here for five years before anything ever happened here, and uh, I had built a pond. I got a stream down down there, and I had diverted my stream and built a acre pond, and built. Uh, I had a was gonna put a log cabin down there beside the pond so that I could put a little paddle boat in. I had bought a paddle boat and and stuff, and I was gonna stock my the pond and uh, for the time being, I, I had put Malibu, uh, Malibu lights down through the woods and, and cut me a, a nice little trail. And I had a, I built a bridge across the pond. Uh, and it was, you know, it was wide enough for a four-wheeler to go across it. And so I had uh, bought me a Coleman tent. And I said, well, I'm going to, you know, put the tent down here and, 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 and stay, you know, spend the night. And... Everything was fine, and at like three o'clock in the morning, uh, I never seen them except for the silhouettes from the moonlight over the tent. But there had to be at least three of them, and they were circling me, going around the tent, growling those deep growls. Uh, I could hear the the hard footsteps, and I'm laying in the tent in my underwear. And uh, I've got I've got uh, my pistol with me, but I was scared to death to, to use it. Now, if something would have stuck its head in there, you know, yeah, of course I would have used it. But for a good thirty five minutes, these things circled that tent and were were knocking down tree limbs and growling and. I didn't know how many was there, but I figured there was at least three. Um, and when they went away, I heard them start going away back down to the other stream about uh, five, six hundred yards away. Um, I jumped up out of the tent in my underwear and ran all the way back up to the house in my underwear and just left everything else down there and the next morning when I came down the tent was tore all to pieces I mean it was down it was all ripped up and um, then I you know I've had a couple sightings I uh, last year when we talked uh, I know I sent you a, a photograph of one that was standing in, in the woods by a big oak tree yep Hey, um, speaking uh, of that picture, do you mind do if you I still have that? do you mind if I use that picture for the uh, thumbnail for this video? No, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. yeah, I'm gonna use that so everyone can see the picture that you're talking about. Um, how much time do we have left? Uh, I've got okay. about I got about five more minutes of recording time. Okay. Uh, I'll try to make this quick then. Uh, See, guys, well, hang on real quick, Lewis. What okay. we're going to do is um, I've got X amount of time to record. So I'm going to do tonight's upload, and then tomorrow we're going to um, finish the recording. That way you guys can have his whole experience and encounters with these um so i apologize but there will be a part two tomorrow night so sorry about that lewis oh that, that, that's fine i can tell you about the uh experiences i had in law enforcement yeah we'll do that tomorrow night if you want is that cool yeah that'd be fine all right mm -hmm. all right so um you've i mean this is crazy what is i remember one of the things that you told me is that you you feel cursed by these things, and to be yeah, honest, it, it's like they they 
everywhere I go now, you know. I mean, well, there's been years that, yeah, I didn't see them, you know, my, but my, my first experience, you know, when I was five. And then, you know, I'm in my 30s when I have my second one, but it's like I move and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having them up to this day. And I shared something with you that I'm sure we'll share later on that really devastated me. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I think that, I mean, I don't think you're cursed. I think what, what's going on is, for some reason, you've got really bad luck running into these things um, because of, like, the choices. Like you said, you were on an old creek, you know, your first place, you know, and it, you were right up butt to the woods. There's always been water involved. Right, right. And I'm thinking that's, that's a lot to do with these encounters because... Um, out in Oklahoma, the, the gentleman that shared his encounter out there, he had a stream on a large amount of property. And there always seems to be a good source of water and a good source of game around where these things are, are spotted. And that was one of the things that Victor shared with us is, you know, they will always be around those areas. So I don't think it's that you're cursed. I think it's just the the choices of where you've lived, you know, like right now where you're living, you're on seven acres pretty far back and, you know, that's perfect area for them. So I'm, I'm wondering if I move to the coast. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, live in a high rise or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> something, I don't know. But, um, all right, so guys, tomorrow night, um, we're going to revisit Lewis. This is Lewis's second half. Uh, unfortunately, at the time of these interviews, I was just starting my channel and didn't have the software to record longer than an hour. So that's why they're about 45 minutes each. So this is the interview that I did with Lewis a day later. All right, everybody. Um, once again, I'm with Lewis. There is a couple of things that um, he'd like to clarify and a couple of things that he wasn't really sure if he should share last night. Um, but after a night of thinking about it, he kind of thought, well, you know, let's let everybody else know the uh the the real deal of what happened on the encounter that uh he and his wife went through but also there was some questions about his speech um i'm gonna let lewis share that right now with you guys so i give you lewis lewis hello everyone uh hope everybody had a good day today um, I know my speech is, is not exactly right right now. I'm trying to recover from a multitude of strokes I've had. Um, I had my first stroke in my patrol car, um, and that ended my law enforcement career. Um, then that was five years ago, and I've had six more. And on my fifth stroke, uh, I could not talk, walk, anything. I had to learn everything back over again. And that's where I'm at now with my speech. And that's why sometimes I hesitate because I know what I want to say, but it, it, it doesn't come out. Um, just bear with me on that. Um, also, uh, I read some of the comments and uh, someone had said I was really brave to, to you know, face that dog man down. Well, I really didn't have a choice. I guess I should have explained it a little bit better. Uh, 
there was a bay window right there at the deck, and I think I told y'all me and my wife just to hand food back and forth through that, that window, but the deck stopped there. It was like a nook, and the house went about six foot farther than the deck, so I had nowhere to go. I was stuck there, so I had no choice but to face that dog man down, and uh, we didn't eat that night. Uh, the steaks were given to the dog the next day. Um, my wife had made um, baked potatoes and salad and um, some other things, but we, we, we didn't eat that night. Um, and luckily, you know, I had went out with the plate and a beer in my hand to, you know, get the steaks off. I had already cut the grill off and was just flipping, making sure they were done when the incident took place. And uh, the other thing I wanted to share that I didn't share last night is uh, we moved uh, the next day. We had already paid rent up for the month. But it, it didn't matter. We moved uh, the church we went to, and yes, I am saved. Uh, I give thanks to my Heavenly Father every day because my doctors say that I'm a miracle, walking, talking miracle, because I've recovered from these strokes, and it could only be Him that pulled me through. Um, a month after we moved, uh, me and my wife separated. A year after, uh, we divorced. She could not handle the situation. Uh, put her through counseling, even while we were separated. Uh, she ended up moving to uh, Tucson, Arizona. She said she didn't want to be around any more bars. And she got hooked on uh, drugs. And she died a few years, years later from a drug overdose. So I wanted to, you know, clarify those things. Um, also, uh, I'm trying to think of the questions that were asked. Uh, there were some questions asked about the photo. Uh, Jeff, is there anything you want to ask me about? What, well, why don't clarified? we wait until the photo, until we're up to that, that encounter? How about that? Oh, okay. All, All right. right. Um, and I'll, I'll start off with, with my, my law enforcement. Um, now, when I started law enforcement, uh, I started out uh, third shift, and uh, this was, really don't want to say the county, because it will kind of give me away, but uh, I will say the, the roads where they intersect. Um, at the way out on Highway 27, uh, Highway 10, Highway 18, uh, we used to have to do a welfare check on a home out there that was off a dirt road, and you went back, and this house was, I would say, to me, it looked like 100 years old. I mean, there was no paint on it. The paint had all come off, but it was all still intact, and you would drive down this dirt road, and then uh, you would pull into where you thought the driveway was. The only way you could tell it, they had red markers, reflectors out there. And, and we were told not to get out of the car. And I had been there numerous times and not seen anything. You know, we, you would just pull in and the grass would be four foot high, like wheat grass, because it, it was not maintained. And you would pull in and uh, go straight out to where the little barn was and then turn right towards the house with the headlights on the house, then back up and then pull out the driveway. Uh, on two occasions, 
uh, the first one that I noticed something was there, uh, I seen yellow eyes in the windows and under the back porch and the front porch. And they, you know, nothing ever come out. I always would look at it and say, you know, what is that? Big cats, big dogs, or, you know, what, what is it? Well, one night, uh, I went through there and pulled in like I always did. And uh, it was usually around 2, 2.30 in the morning. And uh, when I put the headlights towards the house, I could see all the eyes. And as I started backing up, two of these things come out from under the front porch. And I noticed that they were at least four foot tall and they were on all fours. And they were black. And uh, they had yellow eyes, uh, like a golden color. And they, like, bluff charged the car. And I sat there for a minute and, you know, trying to decide should I call this in or, or not. And I, and I didn't. I, I just remembered what, you know, was told, you know, we do a welfare check on the property and I have no idea why we would do a welfare check on that property. That was never explained to me. You know, some of the officers we'd talk back and forth and, you know, come up with different ideas on why we would, would do that. Uh, but the last time I was there, when I was pulling away, they followed me out uh, to the edge of the the driveway as I pulled out through the reflectors and and one of them let out a, a big yelp and uh, as when it let out the yelp as I was driving away I could hear a whole bunch I don't know if they were coyotes that were around the area or whether it was the I call them critters dog men whatever uh, whether they were doing the howling and I'm, I'm thinking it was maybe the alpha that, that come out. And uh, uh, luckily, I was put on day shift uh, about two weeks later. <clears throat> but I don't know. I don't think the day shift, uh, uh, when I was doing it there, if, if they if they come out in the daytime. I don't think the day shifts. I think the night shift was the only one that checked that house. But when I went, when I was put on day shift, I was put on in a different district. Uh, I wasn't wasn't up in that area anymore. And I, I was thankful to to get to that. Um, um, really quick, what were the uh, some of the um ideas that the other police officers shared with you? They thought it was strange that we were ordered not to get out of the car, uh, not to uh, go looking for anything, you know. Right. And, and that was stress to us. They were like, uh, you know, you, you don't need to get out of the vehicle. This is just a welfare check. You know, on did, the property. Did any of those and, any of those guys ever say if they saw anything too, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of the guys uh, that were on my my shift. Uh, you know, they would, you know, sometimes go by the, the same house. You know, on on the days that I was off. You know, I'd, I'd be on two, off three, and on three, off two. So the days. The nights that I wasn't working, you know, those, those other guys would, would go by there and they would always uh, see the, the eyes. Sometimes they uh, would see just, you know, uh, one set and other times they would see a whole bunch of sets of eyes. And they always would wonder what it was, but nobody had the kahunas to get out to find out. And we were told you know, we not to get out of the vehicle. 
you know. And the, like I said, the grass was like four feet high. It was like wheat grass. And that's the only way you could tell where the driveway was. Uh, it was just growing up grass. You, you, you just pull through those reflectors. And uh, another time uh, on night shifts, uh, I had turned off the 27 on to another road. Uh, I can't think of the name of the road right now, but it's a long road. It wraps all the way around to Highway 10. And uh, uh, I think it's about nine and a half miles. And there's a bunch of cow pastures and, and, and stuff. And there's one straightaway uh, on that road. It's a uh, backcountry road. And there's not many houses on that road. I know there's two or three bridges where you cross over creeks. And uh, I was going down that road one night. And my side marker light happened to catch something while I was going down the straightaway. There was one area where you went through two cow pastures and it was probably 500, 600 yards straight away. And then it went into a hard left turn and then another, a hard right. And then a couple miles later, you come in the highway can. Uh, but I was going down that straightaway. I guess I was running 50, 45, 50, somewhere in that area. And my side corner and light, my amber light, caught something on the left side of me. And I looked over, and there is this dog man, uh, as I have seen them, and I know what what they are. And it was running beside my car along the barbed wire fence on the shoulder of the road to the left. And it was keeping right up with me. I didn't try to pick up speed or slow down. I just looked over at it and um, this this thing was the size of a Shetland pony. I mean, it, it was pretty good size. I would say it probably weighed about 300, maybe 400 pounds if I had to guess. Um, and uh, it, it did have a tail. I seen this tail flap and it was real fluffy. And its mouth was hanging open, and its tongue was hanging about six inches out of its mouth. It was almost like uh, a dog chasing a car. You know, you see dogs chase cars sometimes, you know, just run beside it. And then, you know, it, it, it went all the way to the curve. And when I, when I got to the curve, it just slowed down and stopped. And I, I went on around the curve. And um, I, um, about two months later, uh, and was moved to another district that was closer to my home. And I, I really liked that because I could park in my driveway and, you know, get the car at, 15 in the morning sign on and and, and go um, and this was around my area and a lot of times I would leave my house at around 5 15 10 minutes after you know I, I didn't have to sign on till 5 30 and I would just you know cruise around a little bit because I had gotten it, got up early and got dressed. And then I, you know, just looking at different things and going through different areas. And uh, I was going out through one, I'm not going to name the road, just like I didn't name the other road because I don't want nobody to go out to these places. Um, but, I, I went down this one road. Uh, it's probably about five miles long. And uh, it's all country. You might see three or four houses out there. And it's mostly pastures and woods. And 
this one area where I come through a real steep curve that goes off. You go down a hill and you go to a real steep curve off to the right and then you start going back uphill. Um, when I come around that curve, there were three uh, dog men standing in the road, just right in the middle of the road. So I hit the brakes and, and stopped, and they all just stared at me. And one of them started walking up to the car. Well, I put the car in reverse and started backing up. And it started trotting towards me. And it was on two legs. And the other two were on all fours. And as I was backing up, it started trotting towards me. And I hit my uh, PA system and really loud. Uh, it's not the siren, but it, uh, it's called a blaster. It makes a really loud blasting noise. And when I hit that, they, they all scattered. Um, the one that was coming at me, he, he, he took off. He was gone. He went down to all fours and took off. And they didn't all go the same way. They, I think two of them went to one side and the other went to the other, to the other side of the road. Um, and, but I seen them as, as clear as day. And, uh, I didn't see any tails on them. Uh, I really wasn't paying attention to that. I was just, and they looked to be uh, a dark brown. They they weren't black. Um, if they were, then I, I mean, it was the way my lights shined on them. But they looked to be dark brown, and they looked. Uh, two of them were smaller than than the one that. Uh, came towards me. He was, I'd say, maybe seven foot tall, uh, give or take five or six inches. Um, he was real lean. I'd say he probably weighed about two twenty, two fifty. He was, he was just, he was, he was muscled up, but he was lean. Uh, he, he wasn't like a, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of dog man, but he was. He was muscled up. You could you could see the um, his stomach muscles as he was coming towards me. That, that that was one of the things that really freaked me out when I when I see their stomach muscles because I know that they you know got a lot of mid range power. You know, that anybody that's got a six pack has a lot of core power. So. The, there's a couple other uh, encounters that I had uh, that I'm, I'm willing to share right now. Um, last winter, um, my property from my back porch, like right now, it's so thick you, you, you can't you can't see thirty feet past the woods. It's just and it, it, it goes downhill into where my, my pond and the stream is and then it goes uphill and downhill it kind of like rolling hills and in the winter I can from my back porch I can see all my property because all the leaves are gone you know and uh, so I went down to cut some firewood and I'd asked a friend to, to come with me and I told him, I, I said, uh, I hated to, to say this to him, but, you know, because I, I knew what was on my mind, uh, I, I brought my AR-10 and uh, I asked him if he wanted to do some target practicing and uh, I asked him if he wanted to, you know, bring a rifle. And he said uh, that he, he wanted to do some uh, shotgun slugs and I said that's even better just bring it along and so I drove my tractor down in the woods we, we went down at the back part of my woods and I was cutting up a cedar tree with a chainsaw 
And as I was cutting it, he was loading it in the front of my Kubota tractor. And, and uh, all of a sudden, he, like, pushed me in the shoulder because I was using the chainsaw. And he said, I just saw something. I'm like, well, what did you see? And he said, I don't know what it was. He said, it was just a flash. And I, I said, what do you mean, like a light? And he's like, no. He said, this something run like a man. He said, and it was moving out. And, and it was up on top of the, the hill. And he said, it just went twine uh, through there. And he said, it was black. He said, and it, it looked like a bear running on on the back legs. And I said, well, show me where it went. And we both uh, grabbed our, our our guns, you know. Uh, I said, you know, why don't you grab your shotgun and, and all, because I didn't see it, you know. I had my back turned to it. And he, he told me, he said, uh, uh, it went down close to your pond. That's the way it was headed. He said, it was, it was moving so fast. And so we started walking that way. And all of a sudden, it came back the opposite direction towards us. Now, it was probably 60 to 75 yards away, still up on the, the, the ridge of the hill. And every time I watch your show, it looks just like the picture of the dog man running through the woods you know the one that you you've got mm -hmm. where he's like running through the woods yeah in black yep. yep look every time i see that i get chills uh, that's what it looked like now but the encounter you're explaining was, right uh, now real quick just to that is the one from the pictures no 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 that okay. is not no 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 okay. that, that, that's not the one from the pictures all right no the one from the pictures is when uh, my dogs alerted me, and that was the summer before. And I knew that I, you know, had these things, you know, because me and my neighbor had, had talked about it. And I knew from the encounter I had after living up here five years of when I had my tent down there. And uh, I, I knew that these things are everywhere. And, you know, because, you know, they ripped up my tent. That, that's what I told you. you know, I, I, I ran out of that tent when I heard them get far enough away and in my underwear and, 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 and came home. And then the next day, you know, my tent was just tore all to pieces, ripped up. And I, I knew something was going on then. But... Uh, the the summer before that, uh, I think it was right right before we had talked. Um, but it was it was starting to. I think it was either spring or summer. And how this happened? My dogs alerted me. Um, my my yard, my back backyard is fenced in, and. Um, I've got electric wire around the top of my fence because my couple of my dogs like to jump out. <laughs> so I had to put, extend it up. It's a six foot fence, but I had to extend it up with electrical wire. And my dogs were barking and running down to the fence. And uh, I usually keep my phone on me. And, um, I was inside the fence because I had walked out the, the back door and I, I was asking them, you know, what are y'all barking at? What is it? What is it? You know, and they would look and then look back at me and bark. And and I started looking down in the woods and from inside the fence and I didn't, didn't see anything at first. And I just kept looking and watching the dogs. And... One of the dogs was looking at the bushes 
that were about 20 feet from me outside of the fence to the right. And the other dogs were looking down in the woods. And that's when uh, I seen the, uh, the one down in the woods move to the side. <clears throat> and I pulled out my phone and I snapped that picture. And uh, then I took uh, the other picture when he was, was gone, you know, to show that he was standing there. Uh, you should have two pictures. Yeah. One, yeah, I saw one standing there, and then the other one where you can see it's, there's nothing there. Right. And uh, how I found out the other one was in the bushes. Uh, I've seen these things on my property. And these things can hide like you would not believe. It had its head sticking through the bushes right there uh, to my right. Uh, and that, that word circled. And that's what my other dog was looking at and, and uh, was growling at. And it had its head sticking through those bushes. And I never saw that one until... I blew the picture up and started looking at it. And then that's why I took the other picture to show that there's nothing there. It had pulled its head out of there. And the, the other one that was down in the woods, you know, had had walked away. Yeah, that one that was so, the one that was standing. Um yeah, the he, larger he circle. Was a big boy. Yeah, he is huge. I mean I, I I, mean, I was doing comparisons to like the dog uh, house and like the tree and you know I was trying to but he was probably at least seven and a half feet you could clearly see oh, I, went, I went down there and measured that I had two friends go with me and we went down there because I was telling them about it and they thought I was crazy you know they were like oh man you're losing your mind you know what kind of medication do you take and I'm like no <laughs> You know, and and I showed them the footprints. You know, I think mm -hmm. I, I sent you some footprints also with the, mm -hmm. uh, think a pack of cigarettes or and a lighter for size comparison. I'm you know? not and, really sure. I've got a couple. I think the only ones that I have from you are the circled ones and the the comparison picture. I have to. Oh, okay. I'll go back and check. Uh, but well, I still have those pictures of of. The one with the cigarette pack beside of it, and it's probably, I, I think I measured it out at 13 and a half inches long. Wow. And, and yeah, it was huge. And then there's another one with the cigarette lighter uh, where it, it is a canine print, but it's in, in the sand right beside the creek, and it's bigger than my hand. You can see with this, the yellow cigarette lighter right there beside of it, it's it, it's huge. Yeah, I could I could open up my whole hand and stick stick in the in the print. Right. And uh, that that's that's basically it. Uh, but uh, I don't. Uh, it, it's really messed with my uh, my life. Um, because I used to hunt a lot. I used to go out in the woods a lot. And, you know, I, I, even when I go out in the daytime now, uh, and I'm, I'm all, I've got my head on a swivel, every little sound I hear, you know, I'm, I'm looking. And my dogs are pretty good at alerting me. I have two pit bulls and one Rhodesian Ridgeback. And they're all really good dogs. And, uh, but uh, that's it, all except for something else that happened to me. And I'm yeah, um, I'm sorry to the audience. I'm, I'm I'm not ready to share that right now because I'm trying to deal with it. Um, and if I can't deal with it, I. I don't believe you would be able to deal with it either, and I, 
I don't want to be ridiculed. Yeah. Because I'm not a liar. And I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And for those of you that have never seen one, uh, consider yourself lucky. Because if you ever do see one, it's going to change your life. Uh, you will, you, you won't feel safe, uh, if there's any woods around you. It, you'll think twice. Because once you see mm. this, you can't unsee it. That's what people don't understand. It's just burns. Once you see it, burns you can't right unsee into your brain. Yep. Yeah. Now, it's um, just like me being a law enforcement officer. Uh, I saw things. You know, I suffered from PTSD uh, because of, of, of that. I, I, I saw things in law enforcement that, you know, you see a lot of death. You see uh, a lot of things that uh, you don't expect to see. Uh my brother-in-law was in law enforcement for 33 years, and he retired. And I remember when I first started law enforcement, something that he told me. And he said, hey, when you think you've seen everything, wait till tomorrow. And that always stuck with me. Yeah. Um, really, uh, really I want to thank everybody for, for listening to taking the time out to listen to my encounters and the things that's happened to me. Lewis, really quick. Um, you and I had talked about this, uh, and, <clears throat> um, like he, like Lewis just said, he's got one last encounter and this is the one that really, I mean, yeah, he's got ones that have messed him up. This one, I, he shared it with me and, um, you know, he, he needs some time to deal with this. And like he said, uh, if he's not willing to, you know, he, he is still is having a hard time believing it happened. So what's going to make you guys think it happened? And, you know, the comment section is getting better, but you know, when someone's on here and they're sharing their encounters, you know, they're, they're being open and honest and ridicule is not something that should even occur on the comment section because it, it's, it's a way of somebody getting out something that is stuck in their back of their head forever and they're tormented by it. And then comes this schlep that wants to, you know, oh, bullshit, you know, well, who are you to say anything or call bullshit because you don't know and you weren't there. And it's just disrespectful. So I completely understand where he's coming from. And I want to thank Lewis for, you know, coming on and sharing because I know it was hard for him um, yesterday before we even recorded I was talking to him and he was pulling back and I was like listen I'm like you know let's it's not live let's record it and let's see how you do and for the first couple of minutes it really was you know hard going for him but then he opened up and it was like opening the floodgates and you know so we got to remember that during these, while well, these people are sharing their encounters, it's it's not our place to ridicule anybody. You know, it's that's bullshit, and I'm gonna call bullshit on that one. You know, because we we, we shouldn't, you know, m make a mockery of somebody's encounters. Some, you know, someone suffering from PTSD, and Lewis is a perfect example of that. And I was talking to him last night, saying, you know maybe your strokes are caused from stress from these encounters and not sharing them with anybody, you know? So I, I really, I, I thank you very much for coming on and, you know, you're a brave, brave guy for 
coming out and sharing your encounters with us. And, you know, I hope that it helps you and I hope that it helps somebody else come out to share their encounters because, you know, I know it, I, I was talking to you today and you said it, it opened a lot up for you, but you're here again, yeah. Sharon, you know, so I'm... I'm it, it, it did, it, it, it helped me a lot. Um, but I've been holding this in, you know, for quite some time. Um, you know, I, I've been through a lot when uh, I, I was remarried and, and, and on uh, the fifth stroke that I had, uh, that was probably my worst one. And uh, in 2018 on Valentine's Day, my my wife of 10 years walked out while I was bedridden. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm by myself now. I'm having to deal with everything. I'm trying to recover from everything. Um, nothing's been easy. It's all been up, uphill. It's been an uphill battle. And, and to get this, you know, off my chest uh, does make me feel better. And I want to thank everybody for all the nice comments that they they left and if, you, if there's anything that you feel that I've left out that, that you want to know just you know leave them in the comment section and you know I'll let I'll let Jeff know the answers to them but you know if he wants me to come back on and eventually I will uh, and when I come to terms with what happened to me uh, I, I will share it uh, I don't want to be ridiculed, and uh, I'm, I'm not crazy. Uh, and I, I, I've got to be able to deal with this myself, because what happened to me was very surreal. Um, and like I, I'm trying to still figure it out in, in my head. So, like you said, if, if I can't come to terms with it yet, then uh, I don't think anybody else will, will be able to. And, and I don't want to be ridiculed for something that happened that I couldn't help. And uh, I, I don't know who to talk to about. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. But hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to share that with everyone out there and I want to thank everyone for taking the time out to to listen to my encounters and Jeff I want to tell you thank you and I I love your channel and I think you're the best channel out there and you can hear him a lot of holding back on some of the experiences that he has had just really wanting to share and Eventually he does, which will be this interview right here. And uh, this interview, he really does share all of the stuff that had been bothering him for for years. And uh, my heart, my heart truly goes out to Lewis still to this day. All right, guys, today I have a guest that you guys are familiar with and have grown to like uh, like me. Um, great guy, Lewis, and the other day he heard, uh, Adam, and they live very close to each other, and Lewis immediately shot out an email to me saying, I, I cannot believe this, um, it validated everything I said, um, I gotta talk to you, and I said, "All right, let's let's communicate." And today, I give you guys, Lewis. Lewis, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Good. All right. Well, I'm just gonna give you the floor, um, and let you share everything that you want to share. Actually, guys, really quick, we were recording for about four minutes, and we had to start all over again. So, <laughs> this is a retake, Lewis. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Okay. Have at it, buddy. All right. Uh, I want to tell everybody thanks for coming on and, and listening to my encounter and uh, for all the support that everyone gave me uh, when I did give my encounter. And 
I want to tell Adam thank you for coming on and uh, with his encounter stories, and it kind of validated me and made me feel better. Um, I lived uh, about a mile to a mile and a half away from Dale Earnhardt Industries off of Highway 3 in Rowan County uh, when I had my uh, encounter while I was cooking on the deck uh, of my home. Um, so that that was kind of unique there. You know, that's not far. Uh, just a creek over and through the woods, and, and there was Dale Earnhardt Industries. Um, and he also uh, mentioned Highway 73. Um, that comes out of Mooresville uh, on the lower part of the lake, and you cross over a, a bridge, and, and that is McGuire Nuclear Plant. And Lake Norman is, is on the top of the dam, and at the bottom, it's a Catawba River chain, which turns into Mountain Island Lake. And it's all woods for miles, thick woods. Um, that's where uh, there was a Revolutionary War battle that took place in the 1700s. Um, what has happened to me since? Uh, I had uh, two loads of dirt that was brought to my home. I have a wraparound driveway, and I had to have it put there. I'm trying to rebuild the back of my home, uh, some brickwork and some water damage where it had washed out. Um, when the dump truck driver uh, delivered the second load of dirt, it was still light outside. It was starting to get dim. Um, and he noticed one of these creatures down in the woods and he was like, what the hell is that? And I was like, uh, well, uh, what are you talking about? Because I didn't want to freak him out because I knew he was going to bring me some more dirt if I needed it. And uh, I said, what did you see? And he said, something big and black. And he said, it looked like a, a big wolf. And I said, uh, well, I know there's there's wolves around here. And so anyway, he left. Um, and... Uh, I was, this was about a week and a half ago, two weeks, I was out on my tractor trying to spread this dirt, and it was about 7.30 in the evening. I had started at about 5. I was trying to get it done because it was supposed to rain. I was wanting to get it packed down before it started raining. And uh, I had cut my headlights on my tractor and just kept working, and it started getting darker, and you, you could see just a little bit, and um, I noticed uh, there were two figures down in the woods, and that it, the one figure was the one that I sent the photo of to Jeff, uh, and there was another one which was smaller, and I could make out breast on on this one so I think it was a female um they didn't have the dog type legs which leads me to believe it's the werewolf type um and uh one of them let out a scream and I had my phone on me and uh I said, okay, I'm going to capture it. I'm going to capture this scream. So I pulled my phone out and put it on record. And they walked around down there a little bit. And then they come back up. I tried not to stare at them. And they were probably a good 100 yards away from me. And I was just getting ready to shut my recorder off. And then I got the scream again. So I did get it. And I will be sending it to Jeff. Um, a couple of days after that, uh, I had, I had went, you know, I'd got done. I said, okay, I'm finishing up with my dirt. I'm, I'm going on in. It's getting dark. So a couple of days after that, uh, I, I've been up 
remodeling my home on the inside and uh, it was about 3 a.m. and uh, I was washing dishes at the kitchen sink and I have a window that's a, like an octagon style window. It's about, I'd say almost a little bit over two foot wide and two foot tall. And uh, while I was washing dishes, I got a growl and it kind of freaked me out a little bit and my, my dog started barking and growling and they were, they were, had been asleep just laying in the living room in their beds and, uh, they ran over to the kitchen area and were just going crazy whining and, and growling and, and, uh, and then I got a tap and I, I didn't open the window. Uh, I just, I, I didn't want to see what was, was there. And so, uh, a couple nights after that, uh, I was working here in the house and I was in the living room, uh, working on my mantle for my fireplace. And, uh, I heard, a tap at the window, and again, it was around 3 a.m. Uh, I've been staying up late trying to get some of this done, and immediately the the dogs jumped up, ran over, and uh, was sniffing and, and growling and barking and running around the kitchen, and so I walked over to the window, and... I heard a tap and I opened up. I said, okay, no, I'm sorry. I, I took my hand hand and tapped on the, the shade and they're wood shades. Uh, and when I did, uh, I heard a growl again. And so the dogs are really going off now. So I opened the window up slowly. It's got the little twist rod. And like I said, it's made of wood. And there staring me in the face was the hugest thing I had ever seen in my life. Uh, from a distance, <clears throat> I knew it was big, but I didn't realize exactly how big it was. This whole head filled up the window. And the window was like seven and a half feet off the ground. And I could tell it was bending over because I could see the way that its head was positioned and the arch in its back and its mane. And we stared at each other for just a minute. Uh, I'd say probably 20 seconds, no facial expression. Uh, I could see his uh, pains in the front and he had yellow eyes. I did notice that the eyes had a, uh, not a dot, but like a snake. Uh, it's like a black slit that went not all the way down through the eye, but about halfway from the top and from the bottom. Um, they were not circles. And um, we continued to stare at each other, and he smiled at me from one side of his mouth. I think that's what he was doing. So when he did that, um, I had told my dogs to hush and everything, and, and, and he was watching me as I pointed my dogs off to the living room to their beds, and, you know, they walked away. They were growling, but they walked away, and uh, and he did that and he was looking, and then he, he was smiling at me through one side of his mouth. So I smiled back at him the same way. And his head caught to the side. And um, I didn't fear anything. I didn't feel any fear. Uh, I was more amazed at what I was looking at. And then it automatically growled at me, showed me all its teeth. Well, when it did that, I did the same thing back to him, showed him all my teeth and growled back. Well, when I did this, he just stared at me 
and got backed up about a foot from the window and growled real hard. So I growled real hard back. He showed me his teeth, and then he took off out into the middle of my yard and run like two circles around and bluff charged my window, growling at me again, and I growled back. <clears throat> and then my dogs were going crazy again. And he started walking off, and he turned his head to look back at me, and I went ahead and shut the blinds. Um, and, and I went and got my, my weapons because I didn't know what was going to happen. And so uh, it was uh, something else before I go any further. Uh, there was something that I forgot that I had left out. Me and uh, a friend of mine uh, a couple weeks ago, he had bought a new dirt bike. And on my property, I used, I used to race. <clears throat> and years ago, I had built a motocross track on uh, about four and a half five acres of my land uh, so and it had jumps triples and, and, and everything and, and it had all it's all grown up now so me and him uh, he'd got a new 450 four stroke and me and him had went down there and he was on his bike and uh, you know I told him I needed to change shoes before we went down there but actually I came in and got my my weapon and I did change shoes uh, and we went down there and went around looked at part of the track that we could get to it was all grown up and and he said you know if you if you don't mind help me we take the tractor and uh, I said yeah I'd, I'd like to get another bike and you know maybe that'll help my health to get down here and ride again and uh, so we were um, checked everything out there was we had no problems. So the very next morning, um, around 11 o'clock, I walked down in the woods. Uh, I did have my my pistol on my side, my 45 Glock, and I went down to the little stream part. It used to be a pond that I had built, but I had to drain the dam. I mean, drain the lake because the... Uh, the dam was leaking, and now it's a stream that comes through there. And the water is fairly shallow, and there's a lot of quartz. And sometimes I get down there, I can find gold dust and little nuggets. So I was down there, and I was down there for about 15 minutes. And there's embankments on each side that's about 10 to 15 foot high. And I was right at the very start of where the water comes uh, around the, the bend from my property and all of a sudden there was a growl a deep growl and I snapped my pistol and pulled it out and I was squatting down and I set it on my leg and then there was another growl from the other side and uh, I was terrified then. Uh, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, so I got up, I holstered my pistol. I was looking around both times that the growls were happening. I never saw anything. And it sounded like they were five foot away from me, but I never saw a thing. And I just walked up out of the woods onto my prop uh, off of my property you know, in the woods and, and, and come up to my house. And uh, that's that's what happened there. Now, to get back to when uh, he was in my window, now, this has, he, uh, that, uh, I think it was the very next evening, um, I've got a six-foot fence uh, to keep my dogs in, in the back, and it's nine foot now because I have taken and put electric wire around uh, with a, uh, it's like cattle wire and it's electrified. And uh, that night, the lights dimmed in the house and I heard a yelp and uh, some commotion. And then 
the next day when I went out, the wire was like pushed down. Uh, there was some broken branches. I think what it did was it touched it and it lit him up and he hit it and, and it shorted it out. It had blown the fuse. So I fixed it and I put a new fuse in there and rerouted the wire a little different. Um, but it has been to my window at least three times since. Uh, not every night I had that had it come two nights in a row and then it would skip a night and then it'd come back the next night. And, uh, I heard it last night. I don't know if it's going to happen again tonight or not. Um, but it's tapping on my window and, uh, if I don't go open the window, which I'm not going to, then it'll growl and then my dogs go crazy and I just won't open the window and, uh, just leave it at that. I, I, I just think that it's, it's better off for me not to, uh, look at him anymore. Uh, I don't know if that really ticked him off, if me staring him down or what, but uh, kind of let sleeping dogs lie, uh, no pun intended. Um, but that's that's where I'm at right now, Jeff. Uh, right. No. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it's not going to come back. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to do anything rash to these creatures or anything, but um, I'm kind of fed up, you know. Yeah. And also, I have uh, a couple other friends that I'm trying to get to come on or at least write in with their encounters. Um, I've got a friend that lives about four and a half, five miles away from me, and he owns uh, at least a thousand acres, if not more, of old family property farm that's been his family for a couple hundred years and he actually uh had a uh one of his horses and it was a uh um it was probably about six months old um because he had showed me shot me pictures of it sent me pictures of it and uh said you know look at my my new baby you know that was born and in the field where he had it, he noticed something that was stalking it. So uh, he grabbed his rifle. And uh, this is somebody that's not going to lie to me. I've known him for years. And he grabbed his rifle and he jumped on his uh, other horse and chased this thing down through the pasture to the edge of the woods. And when he got to the edge of the woods, it went, he, he started to turn around and to go back home. And when he chased this thing, it was on all fours. And when he started to turn around to come home, he heard a growl and looked back and it was standing on two legs. And his words was, I steadied my rifle and I put a round through that son of a bitch's head and he dropped like a rock. And that was his exact words. And I, I asked him, I said, well, did you go over and look at it? And it was dead. He said, I, I, I seen half of his head fall off. And he said, but I, I didn't want to get close to it. He said, I've never seen nothing like that in my life. And, um, so, and he told me, he, I can't remember if he said it was the next day or the day after that, he had went down there um, because he never seen any buzzards or anything flying around. And he said usually when he has a, a calf or something die or, or something on his property, he has buzzards, but he never seen any. And he went down there and it was gone. And, uh, but he knew that he had killed it, but he didn't know what it was. So, uh, that's, that's everything that's happened to me since. Yeah. That's, and, uh, you guys live in that, some strange, it. you guys live in some strange area. Um, 
<clears throat> Adam, you know, it was cool that Adam reached out to validate what you had to say and share those encounters um, with us because, you know, that added validation to you. And I know that made you feel feel good because, you know, you've been holding on to these encounters and tell people and people just, you know, mock you or kind of think you're crazy. Yeah, because um, people think that you're crazy. Yeah. And, and, and you're telling them exactly what's happening, but you're it's in your mind and you're, you're, you're like, do I tell anybody or do I just keep my mouth shut and just hope it never happens again? Or, you know, it, it, you can't think straight, you know, because you know these things aren't supposed to be around. And, you know, I've, I've actually seen, uh, I know this is not a Bigfoot channel, but I've actually seen a Bigfoot before, you know, and, and, you know, it, it, it was not aggressive or anything, you know, when I was hunting one time, but it just looked at me and then turned around and walked off. Right. And, you know, I got out of the woods. That was it. Were you, uh, were you... I, I knew they were Bigfoot, but I never, you know, knew that, that creatures were like this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> how close, how close to your house? I mean, because I, I really don't <clears throat> have a... A preference you know i mean i know there are dogman channels strictly and then bigfoot channels strictly um an encounter is an encounter in my eyes you know it's just something that we were told that doesn't exist um how close to you or close to your area were you when you saw that bigfoot i was in <clears throat> uwari national forest okay uh that is um, about an hour and a half away from me. All right. Yeah. If you, if you mm -hmm. yeah, I would say about an hour and a half. You got to go through Mooresville, and uh, it's up Highway Forty Nine going towards. If you keep straight, you would go towards Raleigh or to the the zoo, North Carolina Zoo. All right. If you don't mind, would you would you care sharing breaking that down for us that story? Well, what happened was, uh, it was kind of crazy, uh, on how it happened. Uh, I had went to go hunting and, uh, when I got up there, it was, it, I left my house at about 4.30 and I wanted to get up there before, um, it was, you know, light and I had a flashlight with me and, um, I got out, I, I parked my my vehicle and I got out and was uh, walking through the woods with my flashlight and my rifle. And it was, I guess it was about uh, 5.45 then, close to 6 o'clock. It was still dark. And, uh, you know, it, close, it, you know, it was cold, you know, wintertime. And so I'm... Um, um, I'm walking through, and I get probably five or six hundred yards back into the woods, a place that I know that I hadn't been into in the daytime, and um, and this it's going to sound kind of crazy, but what ended up happening was I was walking through the woods with my flashlight, and all of a sudden. Something snorted so loud, made a loud noise, and it scared me so bad that I turned and ran slap face first into a tree, dropped my light, dropped my gun. The light, I, I guess the bulb went out in the, the, the flashlight, and it was pitch black. And I reached in and got my cigarette lighter and flipped my cigarette lighter and went over to try to find a tree to get up against because I was freaking out. I didn't know what it was. And all of a sudden, when I went around the tree, there was a monster buck that was laying there at the tree that had snorted at me. <laughs> so the buck scared me half to death. And uh, 
So I propped up against a tree, and I, once I knew that it was a buck that scared me, then uh, I said, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Everything's good now. I kind of recuperated, got my senses back to me, and, and just waited for it to to lighten up because I, I didn't have a flashlight then and uh, because I was going to make my way to the, where I was going to put my stand. And uh, so... Uh, as soon as it started getting light, uh, I, I picked up my rifle. I tried my flashlight again. I, I had been messing with it, and, and I unscrewed the, the front of my flashlight and just to, you know, just to see if I had broke something. And, and yeah, I, I to the bulb, and I found out later when I had got home. But I walked about a hundred, I'd say a hundred, hundred fifty yards through the woods, and then I started smelling this terrible smell and uh it almost smelled skunkish and uh like garbage kind of like rotten garbage and a skunk and i i thought i was going to come across a, a dead animal or something and uh, i kind of changed i could the way the wind was blowing i could I knew that it was coming from that direction. So I said, okay, well, changing plans. I'm going to go over to the right and, and I can go around that area because I wanted to get up by where the river come in, man, because there was a water source there. And I knew there, you know, I had took a couple, bagged a couple right there before. And I kept walking and I, the smell just seemed to linger. And I'm like, okay, this is crazy, because I had walked about 100 more yards. And uh, as I'm walking, I see a figure about 100 yards up in front of me, and uh, it jumps behind a tree. And I stop dead in my tracks, and I'm sitting here looking at this thing. And I'm like, okay. What is this? And I said, it's, it's got to be a Bigfoot because uh, Bigfoot has been sighted up there. I mean, there's a lot of history up in up in that area in Uwari and of, of Bigfoot sightings. And so I stood there for a minute, and I seen a hand come around the tree and its head come around the tree, and we just stared at each other and. Then he stepped out, right out in the open, and I'm sitting here looking at this thing, and its face was was flat. It had a flat forehead. It had a big nose. I remember that, and it was like a, a medium brown color. Uh, the hand kind of looked like a a gorilla's hands. Kind of, they were were dark colored. I didn't really get a good look at his feet because there was leaves on the ground. Um, and I would say it was probably about eight foot tall, maybe nine, uh, about 450, 500 pounds, I guess. I mean, it was it was huge. And so uh, I just started backing away. And then it turned and, and walked off. And I decided that uh, I wasn't going to hunt that day. So I, you know, walked back to my truck, and and that was it. Wow, yeah, I can't blame you. Um, because I knew these things had existed, and and I had had family members, you know, that had seen them, you know, years ago. Right. And I had always been into the the you know Boggy Creek stuff, and I've got a a book that my mother had bought me when I was like seven or eight and still have it and it's called uh, the legend of bigfoot and uh i still have have that because i was intrigued by by those but you know if it was only them because i think maybe it's like um they're more humanly than these werewolves or dog men and they their temperament is a lot different that I can tell now maybe I haven't just uh 
haven't come across an aggressive one yet because, you know, I'm, I've heard that there are aggressive ones out there. I've heard stories of aggressive ones, but they seem to only throw rocks and, and stuff from people I've talked to that's had encounters, throw rocks at them. And I've actually been camping before uh, at a campground. And uh, at the, oh, what's the name of that lake? Uh, it's up Highway 64, Lake Jordan. Best crappy fishing place in the world. And uh, I was, and they have a whole bunch of campsites, you know, but it's a heavily wooded area. And I remember me and one of my friends were camping in a tent up there. And rocks were being thrown at us. And he thought that I was throwing rocks at him. He's like, man, why do you keep throwing rocks at me? I'm like, I ain't throwing no rocks at you. And one come by me. And I, because I, I, I had my back turned to him, and I was like, hey, don't, you don't need to throw no rocks at me, man. I, I wasn't doing that. He said, I didn't throw no rocks. So we both stood there and looked at each other, and there was rocks coming from in front of us and behind us. Just little rocks. And we were trying to figure out where they were coming from, but we never seen anything, you know, and that was just weird. But after we left and I started hearing the stories about rocks being thrown, then I'm like, well, that's ha that had to be what it was, even though I didn't see them. Right. Yeah, you know, never smelt nothing or anything, but yeah, I mean, who would throw rocks at you? Absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, the, the closest mm -hmm. person... You know, where we were, we were probably 500 yards away. Yeah. And, you know, they were, you know, we, we, we knew they were at their campfire, you know, and they were all sitting up there and somebody was playing a guitar. So, you know, we, we knew they weren't doing it. So we were like, you know, this is crazy. Yeah. Sasquatch is definitely, uh, the culprit for the rock throwing. Um, yeah. The gentleman that I had on last night, uh, he and I spoke for a little bit after the interview and um, we were just talking about, you know, Sasquatch stuff and Dogman stuff and other stuff, um, paranormal and uh, conspiracy theory wise. But we got on the topic of there was a I forgot the name of the YouTube channel, but he's he's a hunter um, it's not Steve How to Hunt, by the way, guys, it, but he's, he just has a hunting channel and they were looking at this beautiful lake and all of a sudden rocks are getting tossed at him and the lake and there's nobody for miles around and, you know, he didn't know what the hell was going on. It was, and, uh, he should Was well, a YouTube channel How to Hunt? I just said no. It was not Steve How to Hunt. Oh, it was, oh it was, I'm sorry. I'm no, that's all right. It was it was nothing to do with cryptids at all. It was just a a strictly like a hunting channel. Um, a small. It was a smaller channel, but not he he. I think he had less than fifty thousand subscribers, so he wasn't big like Steve, um, but bigger uh. than my channel. But he didn't have anything to do, and that was the craziest part because he had nothing to do with cryptids at all and he's just they were looking at it was like a, a nature channel almost like hunting fishing natural world or whatever and these rocks are getting chucked at him and he's like what what the hell's going on you know and he's looking around and panning in and out and they they couldn't see anything and he just he he continued the video as the rocks were getting chucked it was pretty pretty crazy story <laughs> so but wow yeah. um I really, I really enjoy having you on, uh, Lewis. You're, you're well, thank great, you, Jim. a great guest. Um, I really hope that um, you can get those gentlemen that you know to share their encounters with us. Um, even if they don't want to come on, uh, let them know, right. let them know that you know I respect their anonymity. I don't won't even let you know. I won't even say their name. I'll make up some name. Um, if they don't want to come on, I'll narrate it, but you know, it's, it's just really interesting that in your neck of the woods. I think one of them I can get to come on possibly, yeah. okay. but the other, um, I know he will not come on, right. uh, because he, he's, he's 
an older gentleman, and I, I, I might be able to talk him into uh, sending in an email. Well, even if you could just tell this, share the entire story with you, and you could tell it, you know, like as, as a story that you heard um, from, right. from your area, because, you know, now we have you, and now we have Adam's family, you know, there's four other encounters in your general vicinity on top of another person that I know that lives in North Carolina who is, um, uh, they are a cryptozoologist researcher. Um, you know, she goes all around and pretty much goes all the way up to the Great Dismal Swamp and down, you know, and it's just something's going on in the south I, there's a lot of hot spots um i've said it and i'll say it again you know it's virginia north carolina well virginia and north carolina are connected you got tennessee um kentucky it's just mississippi it's something is just really strong there for the dog man and sasquatch um another thing i brought up is we were talking, um, Mark and I, and he was like, you know, it, we just kind of found it funny because dog man, like you, you said, I didn't know what dog man were. I just thought of Sasquatch. And I was like, you know, what's weird is because we got on conspiracy theory. And I was like, you know, you know, what's weird is that I think the government really did just hide these encounters because the LDL right. happened. Um, but there was mention of Dogman long before the 80s, 90s, 2000s, because in Louisiana, you had the Rougarou, you know, and that right. that's the original friggin' Dogman. That, that Dogman term was key, or, you know, it was coined by, you know, Linda Godfrey for the Michigan Dogman, or not or by her, but in Michigan. But we had the Rougarou well before the Michigan Dogman. I mean, there's been right. stories of these creatures. They were just covered up and not shared for some reason. And I'm sure down south, you know, there's probably 80-year-old people, you know, men and women, that have these stories and are just holding on to them, you know. And it's it, like a gold mine of, of encounters down there. So, I... I, now, I... <clears throat> Sorry, no, no, I'm done. I'm done. I know that my first encounter, but I didn't know what a dog man was, you know, when I was five. When I, I told you about, you know, yeah. uh, that, and it was it was whitish gray, and you know, my mother thought it was the devil. Yep. You know, I mean, she that's what she thought it was, and and. You know, and it was kind of like I had forgot about it over the years as I got older, you know. Right. Um, and then she shared that, you know, with my, about what happened to my, my grandfather. Yeah, your grandfather. Uh, in Bessemer yeah. City. And then um, there's two other things I was thinking about that I, that I had thought about and I meant to share with you. I remember my grandmother, she lived uh, in Charlotte, but... Uh, it was a place that was wooded then, and it was a heavily wooded area, and she used to have a store, and a little country store, yep. and across the street from her house was all woods, and I remember her telling me, because I, I used to ask her all the time, because she used to tell me about a, a old cow that mm -hmm. she heard a bell and heard an old cow come out of those woods one time and she was sitting on her front porch one time and she seen a the biggest wolf she had ever seen in her life and there weren't supposed to be any wolves then and i used to tell you know, every time i'd go see my grandmother i said grandma please tell me those stories again yeah. and uh now there was another encounter i don't know if uh, now, this was actually in uh, the papers and the news. I got about here. six minutes, so right. if we can fit it in in six minutes, we're gold. Yeah, at Lake Norman, up here at Lake Norman State Park, there was a uh, someone that had an encounter with a dog man. Uh, I think it was a woman. She had an encounter with a dog man. You can look it up. 
uh, and it's at Lake Norman State Park, and that's just right down from me. All right. You want to give us the gist on that in, in, in six minutes quick, if you remember? Um, I really don't know all about it. The um, only thing I, I, I just read is, is the woman was, uh, you can drive through the state park. It's heavily uh, wooded, and there's campsites. You can't bring campers, no electricity, no nothing, and it's right uh, that covers the upper part of the lake. And uh, it's real thick woods. Uh, there's no houses right in that area. And uh, she was driving through the park um, and ended up stopping to get out to look at one of the camping areas that she was thinking about maybe having a family come camp at. And she had seen this thing standing up behind a tree. And she got in her vehicle and hauled ass out of there. I'm going to see if I that, can I mean, that's that. basically what it what the article said. Right. I mean, you can look it up. I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look that up. Lake Norman. All right, that's awesome. Um, Once again, it's always a pleasure having you on. You're, you're a straight-up classy guy. I like having you on. Um, One thing that I do want to let everybody know is... In case you haven't noticed, Lewis is gaining his ability or his speech ability back after the strokes. Um, if you Thank go back, God. if you go yes. back and listen, he's he sounds ten times better. Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad that your health is getting better. Um, well, thank you, Jeff. You know, uh, me too. I've done a lot of praying, and uh, I know when I first came on, it was hard for me to pronounce my my words uh, I sound, sounded like I was from way back in the sticks <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know um, it's getting better I can pronounce my words better and uh, I can get them out because yeah. the problem was I knew what I wanted to wanted to say but uh, my mouth would not work right. Right, right. If that and, makes sense. And you could hear it because, you know, and people, you know, we had told people that you had your strokes and, you know, they, it was almost like you were thinking about what you were saying. You know, it wasn't a, it, you didn't sound bad. You, you just, you, you had stroke and it wasn't your fault. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that. I've actually health. had eight. Eight, yes. Eight and I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. Definitely. I'm I just, thank him every day that I wake up and I go to bed. Yeah. I'm really glad. Thanks for, for having me on, Jeff. Thank you for coming on tonight. I appreciate it. Have a great day and uh, God bless, all right? All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to my encounters. And uh, thank you again, Adam, if you're listening. I, I'm pretty Good sure Good night, everyone. Is. Good night, buddy. And there you have it, folks. All three interviews. Uh, that took about a year to complete. The first two were right after one another. And then the third was roughly 10 to 11 months later on. And uh, just really nice guy. My heart still goes out to him, like I said. And, uh, you know, you could just hear the anguish in his voice. And, you know, it, it's been a pleasure knowing Lewis. Just a super nice guy. Anyway, with that being said, I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that keeps the channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives us folks a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment-free? Just simply treat it with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.